Kyle Glazer from Baseball America, senior writer, joining us right now. You can follow him at Kyle A. Glazer. And Kyle, great to see you. Happy uh, off season to you, obviously, as you can tell. Pretty busy day already. How's your week going? Uh, it's going pretty well. Just got back from wrapping up the World Series last week and uh, came back this week, took care of some stuff around the house. And I'm on the West Coast, so wake up Monday morning, a lot of news right away. Definitely uh, a busy Monday already. But this is the fun time, the off season. Agreed. I want to jump right into your coverage of Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who is going to be one of the highest paid free agents this off season. You've been covering him for years. So first off, let me just get your big picture look at what you've seen from him. You know, anything you can give us that has been unique to your experience of covering him over the last several years. Yeah, look, this is one of the best pitchers to come out of Japan. And, and that's saying something when you look at the history of Hideo Nomo and Masahiro Tanaka and Yu Darvish, of course, Shohei Otani. He has just won his third straight Sawamura Award, which is the equivalent of the Japanese Cy Young Award. He's a back-to-back -back winner of uh, the MVP award in the Japanese Pacific League. He's the only pitcher in Nippon professional baseball history to throw no hitter in back-to-back -back seasons. Again, Nomo didn't do that. Tanaka didn't do that. Darvish didn't do that. This is one of the best, most decorated pitchers, not just in the game today in Japan, but all time. And that's saying something when you consider the rich history of pitchers to come out of Japan. Is there a concern that he kind of had a uh, I mean, a down year in his in his terms compared to the previous two years when he was absolutely lights out. No, not at all. I mean, when you consider his down year is he just struck out 14 batters in game six of the Japan series, breaking a record for a single game Japan series uh, mark set by Yu Darvish and just won his third straight equivalent of the Japanese Sayung Award. And what we saw just from a scouting perspective is he was already great. He's someone that teams have wanted for years. But talking to some pro scouting directors, they feel like he took even another step forward this year, just in terms of the crispness of his stuff, how quickly and efficiently he was working. Um, this is someone that isn't just someone who's going to come over and be a part of a staff. This is someone who can come over and lead a staff as a number two starter. No one sees him as anything worse than a number three starter. And whatever reservations teams had about maybe he's a little on the small side, he's plenty strong. He's shown the ability to hold his stuff deep into games. Um, there were very few doubts about him coming into the year, and whatever lingering doubts there were, he eliminated them. He's a consensus, you know, front of the rotation type of arm in MLB. Well, there's one good thing he doesn't have to worry about. He threw 138 pitches in his last start. He ain't going to have to do that in MLB. He'll throw 70, and they'll be like, yep, you're tired. Time to hit the bricks, kid. See you in a week. I mean, that's a good thing, right? He's shown the ability to do it. The bad part is we'll never get to see him do it because everybody will yank him out after 70 pitches. Yeah, and that's the big thing with him. You know, he's a smaller guy. He's 5'8", 176. Obviously, there's not many major league starters of any, you know, type, aces or back end guys that are that size. But he's strong within his frame. He's got a fast arm. He's a good athlete. And he's shown that ability throughout his career. Uh, he's thrown at least 170 innings, three consecutive seasons. And again, you see him holding 95, 96 into eighths, into ninths. There's really not much concern about his durability just because he's gone out there and shown it. Now, there's always a transition period in Japan. Pitchers only throw once a week. They come over to the U.S. It comes once every five days. The ball's a little bit different. But we've seen a lot of standout pitchers make that transition no problem. Again, Darvish, Tanaka, Otani, all the way back to Nomo, Daisuke Matsuzaka. This guy is on that level, so there's not really concern about his ability to make that transition going from pitching once a week to once every five days, even though he's not the biggest guy in the world. Do we know anything about his desires in the sense of talking to Masa, talking to Masahiro Tanaka, he didn't want to pitch for anybody but the Yankees. He had this historic view of the Yankees. Even when he his years with the Yankees were done, he said, he told me, I will not resign with anybody except for the Yankees. And he, he stuck to that. So does Yamamoto have any concerns like that is there you know do we know anything on that end 
nothing public. Again, Masahiro Tanaka was very much, you know, Yankees tried and true. That was clear even when he was coming out. Shohei Otani made very clear early on he wanted to pitch on the West Coast or in the Western half of the U.S. at least. There hasn't been anything like that surrounding Yamamoto yet. Now, again, he still has yet to be formally posted. His team orcs announced they were going to. It isn't done yet. There's still a lot of time to go in the offseason. Negotiations will unfold. Patterns will emerge. But at this exact moment in time, there's not really any specific geographic location that he reportedly favors and teams from all over have been scouting him the Cubs have been aggressively scouting him the Red Sox the Giants Dodgers Padres Yankees all the teams that we see are typically active in getting the top talent from Asia they're all involved coast to coast because this is one of those talents that if you have a shot you're going to take it what have you heard on the downside from scouts have you spoken to any scouts that are kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum here Kyle where they've said you know what, our team is not going to fork up this kind of cash for an undersized right-hander. Or, hey, we don't like how he's been pitching quite a bit over there. For example, 138 for some front offices, they're like hiding their eyes and saying, please make it stop. You know, they're hey, projecting like forward said, already. he doesn't have to worry about it because he'll never get past 75. I know, but they're already looking back being like, <laughs> first injury, we're going to blame this Japan series right, on it. 138 pitches. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I've actually actively tried to find that because you're right. The only right-hander who's a comparable size and frame is Marcus Stroman, and even Stroman's a little bigger. But I've been really surprised that I have not found anyone who is worried about him just because of what he's done, how strong he is, how the arm works. It's a clean delivery. And again, the big thing with him is he has a clean bill of health. You know, this isn't a guy who's only been throwing 90 innings a year for three years in Japan. He's been going 170 plus the last three years, you know, you know, into 150s earlier in his career. He's held up really well. There's not really any health concerns. So again, you never know. There's always a concern with every Japanese pitcher about you know like the mileage on their arms, especially the way they're thrown is used. You look at the Koshian tournament, there's guys throwing 200 pitches. But all in all, his medical reports to date are clean. He's shown the ability to log innings. He's shown the ability to hold his stuff and his command deep into games. He's got a deep pitch mix. I mean, everything you want to see from a guy, he has shown it. So there's not really any concern despite the fact he is smaller. So when I see Japanese guys, Japanese pitchers come over, and I have a different evaluation for hitters, Japanese hitters, in a sense, are AAA type of contact-oriented hitters. Obviously, guys in AAA strike out a lot. I think I've seen, I think it was your, maybe it wasn't your article. Yeah, it was your article. You wrote that he's a two or a three. And yet, he is projected to make, $200 $200 million. So what I look at is outs in the zone. Outs in the zone is a huge precursor. We don't know what the hitters he was facing. We don't know, you know, we know the level of hitters, and some of them are big league type of hitters, but most of them are just maybe a step down, maybe more like a platoon type of big league hitter. And his right. outs in the zones, he has 84 outs outside of the zone, strikeouts 84 strikeouts in the zone comparable yep. the only other pitcher jordan montgomery that's in a free agent this year jordan montgomery is 80 and 86 80 outside his zone, so very similar jordan montgomery is how many years older and is looking to get 120 maybe 200 million is not enough you look, he's someone that is is going to get paid. There's no question about it. You talk about the stuff in and out of the zone. He can blow hitters away with his fastball in the zone. It's 94-96. He's been up to 99. It's got life. And the way it just comes out of his hand, it's like a speeding bullet. It just gets on hitters. It's direct. It's sharp. He can locate to both sides of the plate. He can elevate it. So, again, it's not just pure stuff with him. It's command. And also, he's aggressive. He pounds the strike zone. So, even though maybe some of his strikeouts come outside the zone, he's setting it up because he's so aggressive in the zone. Fastball, fastball, drops that plus splitter down below it. Guys are helpless. And he's got a really good curveball, too. One of the things with a lot of Asian pitchers, Japanese pitchers in particular, is you see a lot of times they have good fastballs, good splitters. The breaking stuff maybe just needs a little more refinement and because it's not thrown a whole lot over there. He's actually rare and unique in that he has a plus curveball already. So you're getting a guy with three plus pitches out the gate. 
He can set hitters up in the zone, finish them out of the zone. He can beat them in the zone. It's our ability to get out so many different ways with so many different pitches that makes him so appealing and why most projections have him getting that seven-year, $200 million type deal. Got to remember, he's in his mid-20s too. This isn't a guy who's in his early 30s and you're looking at a shorter window of his prime. In a lot of cases, he's still got his prime ahead of him. And again, even though it might not show up statistically from a scouting perspective, a lot of evaluators thought he was even better this year than the previous years. This is a guy who's still getting better. And in his mid-20s, I mean, you guys know a lot of guys don't really peak till 28, 29. His best years might still be in front of him. Two questions for you on this front. Number one, does it matter when a head of a front office goes out to watch a player like this pitch in person? Or is it still just going to be about money? You know, if the Oakland A's or whoever it is offers him more money, even if they're a shittier franchise, right? And they won't even give you a chair that works. You're going to go there. Is, is that a thing you think? I know Kratz mentioned Tanaka, but specifically in this case, and also Tanaka was a long time ago at this point. Curious on that front. And also if teams talk to players um, like Yamamoto about how they're going to use him, where Kodai Senga was really more of a once a week pitcher for the Mets. They almost always gave him an extra day of rest, which I think made a difference for him. Yeah. So in terms of relationships formed by general managers going over there, that's really player dependent, no different than American players. Some players, those interpersonal relationships are really important. Others, it's show me the money. And with you know, Shohei Otani, for example, his relationship with Billy Epler, specifically Epler scouting him since he was a rookie with the Yankees, that played a role in his decision to sign with the Angels. In terms of Yamamoto, there have been no public outward signs of anything like that, where there's a special relationship he has with someone that will play a factor here. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to remember these negotiations haven't even started. He still hasn't even officially been posted. Teams haven't had the ability to engage with him yet. So once he's officially posted, Teams are able to start engaging with him and his agent. We'll get a better sense for how much that means to him, but a lot of that's still to be determined. Okay, I'll probably get this name wrong. Shota Imanaga. Yeah. Imanaga. Imanaga? Okay, yeah. Shota, Imanaga. Shota Imanaga. Imanaga? Yeah. Is he fitting himself in the top 20 free agents? Is that a lefty that has devastating off speed, but maybe the fastball that might not quite play at the big league level? Or what are we looking at with him or other free agents that are coming over from Japan, Korea? Yeah, so Shota Imanaga, uh, we saw him start for Team Japan in the World Baseball Classic Finals against Team USA through the first couple innings. He's more of a crafty left-hander who's seen as kind of a back-end starter, a number four, number five, league average type of guy. His fastball is sits 91 92 can get up to 95 and it's more of a deep pitch mix he doesn't have a, a nasty split you know his slider is, is just kind of an average pitch but he's able to move the ball around he's able to change hitters eye levels he's able to kind of keep them off balance he's a really smart left-hander and it was very efficient most teams view him as that number four, number five, gives you five solid innings, and then you pull him out. There are a few evaluators who think that he might be best in more of a, a long relief role. We saw him pitch those two innings to start the finale of the World Baseball Classic against Team USA, and his stuff ticked up a little bit. And so there's a sense that if you put him in a two-inning type of stint, all of a sudden he can be a little bit overpowering. But as a true starter, which is what most teams are going to want their option A to be in signing him, again, it's more that crafty lefty back of the rotation, you know, four pitches, knows how to pitch and, and can give you five solid innings than any sort of front of the rotation type of starter. Kyle, awesome to talk to you and definitely get the lowdown on Yamamoto and a little bit here on Imanaga. Um, got other guys to ask you about um, next time. So we'd love to have you back soon, obviously, to talk about Lee, the Korean outfielder, and also um, lefty reliever Yuki Matsui. But, of course, Craig Council decided to just absolutely rock our world today. So um, we appreciate you, Kyle. <laughs> We'd love to have you back on pretty soon, all right? My pleasure. Anytime, guys. Thank you, Kyle Glazer. <laughs>